I said this morning, Pastor Derek Puckett is, has been kind of the visionary. Charlie, Pastor Charlie Dates has been kind of, he's the preacher. This morning we had Pastor Paco, the, the shepherd, and then we had your thug friend, Pastor Michael Carrion. And now we're, we're coming to our conclusion, and, and this is the prophet. I've had the privilege of watching Jackie's life for the past 10 or 12 years and just see her grow into someone who's a needed voice in this generation. Many of you have been impacted by her and, and her husband Preston over the years, but I've seen behind the curtain. I, I, I've known her when she was working at Wendy's in St. Louis, and uh, my guy Preston was interested in her, and so I offered her a job here in Chicago. She moved up here about 10, 10 11 years ago. She broke up with Preston that first day. <laughs> like, literally, Preston calls me. He's like, she broke up with me. <laughs> I'm like, Jackie, a lot of people could have seen a hardness in her due to past experiences. But when you get past all of that, the beauty of Jackie is evident that the Holy Spirit is at work. She's an individual who is bold in her proclamation of the truth. She says it in a way that kind of pierces the heart but makes you laugh at the same time too. She has a really creative way to, to do that. She really cares about people. She'll try to pretend like she don't care, but she really does have a, a gentle heart. And I always say she's kind of like my, my little twin or whatever, because we both love, our love language is sarcasm. And so we'll just kind of go back and forth all day and so forth. So Jackie, I love you. Let's welcome our final speaker, Jackie Hill Perry. Thanks. One, two, three. Y'all hear me? I said, I don't want to use a little Charlie Dates mic. <laughs> One, two, oh, my bad. Appreciate it. That was the quickest I ever seen you move. <laughs> Look at you, running for the gospel. How are y'all doing? That's, uh, that's good. So, yeah, I mean, Brian was right. It's funny because when he, I was working at Wendy's, you know, making Junior Bakers and stuff. And I was also like in ministry actively at Wendy's, but also in my church. And Brian like randomly called me and was like, hey, you want a job? And I was like, I got to move. And he was like, yeah. And I'm like, nah, I'm cool. And he was like, but what if you make X, Y, Z as far as money? I was making $7.50 an hour. I thought that was all right. And I was like, I moved. Long story short, Preston told me in hindsight that he prayed that the Lord would create an opportunity for me to move to Chicago. Because the Lord knew I'm not going to move for no man, but I'll move for some money. Hello. So I, I, miss, I miss a lot about Chicago, everything but the taxes. But I'm in Atlanta now with Preston. We've been married almost 10 years. We have four children raging from, amen, praise God. We have four children ranging from the ages of eight to one, and so we are perpetually sleepy. And we have a dog named December, and so our life is full, and God is great, and I'm here to preach. I, I, I'm here to talk about the idea of prayer, and so before we begin, I, I, wanna, I wanna pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness and, and making us right with you. We, we can get very used to knowing you that we forget the miracle that that is. And so I'm, I'm thankful that you, you have made us instruments of mercy, that you have helped us to experience grace, and that even now is, is a grace. To, to, to hear from you through your word is, is a grace to to want to know and understand your word is a grace. To have the ability and the power and even the courage to obey it is a grace. And so I pray, God, that you would be honored, that you would be blessed, that you would be seen and understood. I pray that you would meet your people, 
that whatever they need, that you would provide it. I pray that you would convict where there is need of conviction, that you would encourage where there is need of hope, that you would, you would just meet us in a diversity of ways because you're able to do it. And so I pray for the grace and the power and the humility needed to serve you and your church in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the first prayers we've ever prayed were prayers of petition. There was some need that we had of God with, with the faith that he would answer. When we were children, we might have prayed for Christmas to come a bit sooner. As adults, we pray to be skinnier for a better credit score. We ask God to show us where we left our keys, you know, things like that. He cares. <laughs> he does. As leaders or, or people who participate actively in ministry, we should be very familiar with petition. We petition God for wisdom and strength. We petition God for the ability to love the unlovable or to engage with the irritating. We, we beg God for the courage to do what he told us to do and to say the hard things. And if we're not in the ministry of asking, maybe we shouldn't be in ministry. But tonight, we're going to look into the petition of a woman by the name of Hannah that I hope will inform even our own act of asking. If you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Say amen when you got it. Four of us. I'll wait. Starting at verse 19, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. I really love the Bible. When we, when we open up the book, 
of 1 Samuel. In the first few verses, we are welcomed into an interesting situation. We, we immediately learn about a man named Elkanah and how this man has two wives. Complicated, weird, awkward, but Old Testament. <laughs> One wife is named Hannah. The other wife is Peninnah. We are not given a genealogy or some framework or, or some understanding of their family of origin like we are Elkanah, but we are still given a piece of information about, information about their family dynamic, which is that Peninnah has children and Hannah does not. That is a problem. Everybody say problem. I have four points today and the first one is the problem. Before we ever send up a petition towards heaven, it's usually because we've identified some kind of problem on earth. When, when we petition God for provision, the problem is financial lack. When we petition God for wisdom, the problem is, is that we, we know ourselves enough to know that we don't know everything. If ever we decide or choose to petition God for humility, the problem we're trying to fight against is pride. Every petition is a faithful attempt to overcome a problem. In the second verse of this chapter, we learn that Elkanah, or we learn that the problem in Elkanah's home is that Hannah, his wife, is barren, infertile. Infertility is a common occurrence in the Hebrew scriptures. From Genesis to 1 Samuel, barrenness is experienced by Sarah, by Rebekah, by Rachel. And here in this text, it's, it's Hannah. Infertility is a problem in the sense that it creates an environment of internal and external shame which is quickly magnified by communities where motherhood is looked at and deemed at and communicated as the ultimate symbol of blessing. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, one of the promised blessings of obedience is a fruitful womb. And if curses are the reversal of blessing, then the consequence of disobedience in Deuteronomy is what? Infertility. So women like Hannah not only had to reckon with and deal with the internal stigmas, the internal shame and feeling like she is not woman enough, not wife enough, not good enough, but she also has to deal with the religious assumptions that she is barren because she's disobedient in some way. When women don't bear children, fingers are always pointed. There has to be some reason why Hannah ain't got no babies. To them, maybe even to herself, if Hannah's womb was the problem, then Hannah must be to blame. But who does the text point the finger at? Look at verse 6. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Here now we, we are face to face with that, that conflict of sovereignty and suffering the dynamic that befuddles the strongest and the weakest of saints. It's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to comprehend how God, the sovereign king of the universe, the Lord of hosts, the good Lord, could allow infertility when he knows it, it a hurt. The, the, the temptation that arises in discussions such as this is, is the temptation for redefinition. And by that, I mean, we, we have a habit of looking at our circumstances and defining God by the circumstance instead of defining God by the scriptures. We say this situation is bad, therefore, if God allowed something bad, he must not be good. But, but the way we resist this temptation is easy. It, it's actually by understanding that our circumstances are not authoritative. They're not inherent. They, they don't have the authority to define God's nature. God defines God. More specifically, it is Jesus who made him known. Therefore, the starting point of understanding why God allows a thing must begin with Jesus' own testimony about himself. Nicodemus called him good, and he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Therefore, if God is good, then the way we understand our circumstances is understanding that even if it's hard, God hasn't changed. Even if it's difficult, God hasn't changed. Even if it persists, God hasn't changed. If, if and when we determine the nature of God according to what we go through, we will end up worshiping a God made in our own image. Who is good when everything is good. And it's bad when everything is bad. And, and I say worshiping a God in our image because that's how you are. You are the one who changes with the wind. 
You are the one who was mutable. You, you are the one who mutates according to what happened to you. One person walked in the room and you got an attitude. That's, that's you. That's not God. So, so no wonder, no wonder why we're so slow to petition God at times. Because if we subconsciously expect God to behave like us, then we limit him. We, we restrict him. We, we, we might have the assumption that uh, I can't give him this because he's unavailable like we, we are sometimes. Or I can't give him this because he's unbothered like, like we are sometimes. But if God's nature is unchanging, the hope of our petition is that God is always good. That means that when life is hard, when life is insufferable, when ministry is hard, when leadership is hard, when family is hard, when your body is hard, it means that if God is good, he must be doing something good in me and for me through it. And the same God has said over and over in a diversity of ways, but specifically in Hebrews, that there is a throne of grace available when we have a need. And if you are as needy as I think you are, that means that you should constantly be at his feet. Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord closed Hannah's womb. And perhaps it's because he wanted to birth something in her heart before he birthed something in her womb. Point number two, point number two is the pattern. It's one thing to have a problem that lasts for a couple hours. We know how to handle quick problems, you know. It's, a, it's another thing when the problem persists. What, what happens when the problem continues? What happens when God doesn't answer our petition as quickly as we prefer? What happens when the pain continues? What happens when the suffering doesn't let up? What happens when the confusion doesn't seem to lift? What happens when the discouragement doesn't decrease? When you've prayed for days and then weeks and then months and then years and there doesn't seem to be an answer, it is really hard to trust God when the problem becomes a pattern. The thing is, Hannah's infertility and therefore the emotional consequences of her suffering, all of that was not a short-lived experience for her. Her problem went on for years. Look at verse 3. It says it. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Verse 6. And a rival used to provoke her, provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. When the the scriptures mentions time, it's on purpose. Year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Elkanah is a consistent spiritual leader in his home, albeit his polygamy does cast a shadow on the complete purity of his faith. But he doesn't neglect the yearly trek to Shiloh to worship. According to the text, Elkanah and his family went up to Shiloh year by year, which means Hannah's problem didn't just go away. She couldn't shake it off. She couldn't get over it. The Lord has kept her womb closed year by year. If that's not hard enough, notice the context to which she is constantly reminded of it. The text says that every time They went to Shiloh to worship. Peninnah used it as an opportunity to provoke and irritate Hannah about her childlessness. Imagine, (laughs) imagine what it must be like when the place you go to worship God becomes the place where you're reminded of what God has withheld from you. To to be in a church and see pregnant bellies. To, To be in the church and see healthy children. To be at conferences and hear from confident church leaders with thriving ministries. To see and and hear preaching that comes easy for some people and hard for you. To to watch people raise funds with half the effort and double the resources. It would make worship a bit complicated. On the day when Elkanah would go to the temple to sacrifice, the entire family would sit down to eat. This, this meal functioned as a celebration. It was, it was a way to, to give thanksgiving to God. It, it, was a, it was a meal where they worshiped. A portion 
of the sacrifice Elkanah made would have been given back to him from the priest and he would have went home and sat his family down and they would have distributed portions of the meat according to the amount of children each wife birthed. So, so what should have happened is that Peninnah and her children would have gotten many portions and Hannah would have only gotten a portion for herself. When, when worship reminds you of what God has withheld. But Elkanah, he loved his wife. So instead of giving her one portion, he gave her double. I know that preachers love to meta, meta, like make metaphors out of that. It just, it's just more food. That's, that's, it's not a metaphor there. Yet, <laughs> let's not forget what's happening. <laughs> Panina is zealous to irritate. We always got opposition from someone. Panina is zealous reminding Hannah of the children she doesn't have. So on one end, she is experiencing love and, and generosity and intentionality and nourishment and encouragement from her husband. But on the other end, she is being provoked and being irritated. And in the middle of it, she's probably confused. She doesn't even know what she could have done. She doesn't know why she's not pregnant, if, if she's blessed or if she's cursed, if she's loved or if she's hated, if she's seen or if she's invisible, if you, if you, if you put yourself in her shoes. You can imagine how emotionally chaotic that feels. When you don't know, like you, you know you're loved, but you also get so much hate. One day you're strong and then the next day you're weak. When, when you, you know you should be happy at these celebrations, you should be happy on Sunday, you should be happy during the conference, on the conference, but, but grief has all of your attention, it's confusing. And it's in that place that the text says, that Hannah does what we all do when life feels too emotionally heavy to handle is that she wept and would not eat. And do not hear me saying she did not eat because she was fasting. Do not hear me saying she did not eat because her stomach wasn't growling. If this meal is a celebration of worship, if this meal is an avenue of thanksgiving, it means that Hannah couldn't eat the food because Hannah couldn't worship God. David once said, my tears, my, my tears have been my food day and night. There are times when your problem is so big that it can overwhelm you to the point that the only thing you have energy for isn't even substance but tears. When year after year the problem becomes a pattern that God doesn't seem to care to fix fastly. There's a story in John chapter 11 about a man named Lazarus. He and his sisters were friends of Jesus. I wonder what that was like. I would have tried to play spades occasionally. <laughs> he would have had to be my partner. I can't cut Jesus, you know. <laughs> and he knows his books. Like, he's not, he not going to mess that up. But uh, he and his sisters were, were friends of Jesus. And, and Lazarus got sick. And while Jesus is away, some people come to Jesus and they tell him about his friend. And the narrative says something really interesting about Jesus' response to the news. It says that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters so that when, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two days. That's weird. That's confusing. It just said that he loved him. So, so if he loves him, he should be a bit more urgent. If he loves him... He should be in a hurry. If he, if he loves them, he shouldn't be waiting. Like, like they just petitioned him, Jesus, you are the healer. You are the Messiah. Like, come to your friend. But he, he stays. It's because he waits that his friend dies. It's because he waits and takes his time that his friends suffer. It's because he doesn't move when they want him to that everything actually gets worse. And then we find out why. Jesus answers the questions. He says, it is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What if God took his time in delivering you from certain seasons because he had glory in mind? Yeah. It's big picture. He's, he's big picture. What if God has stayed his hand so that circumstances got so complicated that it became impossible to fix by natural means so that when it is lifted, when the miracle does happen, you know that you didn't do it. Because the truth is, the truth is, some of you are so capable, so smart, so intuitive, 
so resourceful that God has to give you problems you can't fix to keep you. God has to put you in a position so that you can know humility because if you could overcome anything, you wouldn't need them. What if God, what if God is more committed to your sanctification than he is to your comfort? That's the hard pill to swallow. But Hannah's womb, her womb has been closed year by year, and there isn't much that she can do about it. But glory be to God that he is setting the stage for his glory to be seen. Point number three, the petition. Look at verse nine. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant, And remember me and not forget your servant. Notice what she calls herself, your servant. But will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. After dinner, Hannah hasn't eaten. She's sad. She gets up and she goes to the temple. Notice she doesn't go and indulge on crackers and cookies. Notice she doesn't go and indulge on pornography. Notice she doesn't go and indulge on edibles, ways to cope with suffering. She doesn't try to expedite it. She doesn't try to move herself out of the feelings of the suffering. She goes to the temple and she begins to pray. It's easy for us in certain Christian contexts to go straight into the pragmatic portions of her prayer parsing it out and interpreting it exegetically and systematically, but I don't want us to miss, did you see all the emotions of the text? It says, deeply distressed, she wept bitterly, troubled in spirit, pouring out my soul, great anxiety and vexation. The writer uses six different phrases to describe her emotional range as she talks to God. Dan Allender calls emotions the language of the soul. That's why Psalms, I think, is the biggest book of the Bible because God wants us to be honest with him about our feelings. They were given to us by God. And as much as we want to ignore them with people, the one person who should know how broken we are is Jesus. Our problems, our problems are too big and our feelings are too loud and too strong for us to enter into God's presence with anything less than honesty. By bringing her emotions to Jesus, to God, Hannah is bringing her whole self. You are not a robot. You are a human being. And there are some forms of theology that want you to think that you are all mind, but you are also body. You are also soul. You can't think your way out of everything. Hannah is feeling a lot of things. And rightfully so, because remember the first thing we learned about Hannah, we learned that she didn't have any children. So there were internal and societal struggles and it's driven her to this point. She's come to the temple for this reasons to present her problems to the Lord, the Lord who allowed it. And I love how she begins her prayer. She, she doesn't begin the prayer with the problem. She doesn't begin her prayer with the pattern. She starts her petition by addressing a person. She says, O Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, as we most likely know, is a military name for God. It communicates the the idea that God is sovereign over cosmic and earthly hosts and which he will overcome on behalf of his people. But I'm intrigued by why A woman who is dealing with infertility would call God by that name. Like, why did she open the prayer with that? And I think it's because the name of God that we employ in prayer can function as a reminder to the soul. It's an act of meditation. So so if God is the Lord of hosts, then he is sovereign. He is powerful. He is in control. And if that is the case, then there is no circumstance, even in her body, that God can't change. What is the name of God that you need to employ in prayer in this season? For some of us, it might be Savior. 
Some of us might be so hyper aware of our struggles that we meditate on our sin and our shame more than we do on the salvation we received. And so maybe you need to begin your prayer, Savior. For some of us, it might be Father. Sometimes leaders and those who participate in ministry, we, we are caring for and thinking about and nurturing everybody else that we forget that we are actually children. Perhaps you are weary because you are very clear, clear that Christ is Lord. You're good at obedience, but maybe you need to be embraced by the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hannah calls God the Lord of hosts because he is sovereign over angels and demons, over water and wind. And if the Lord of hosts is the same God that closed Hannah's womb, then he is the same God that can open it. But don't hear me say that God will always do what we ask. Because if he doesn't open it, if he keeps it closed, he is also big enough to give you joy in the middle of sorrow. That's how good he is. <laughs> Hannah doesn't just need a war. Like, like Hannah recognizes that she needs in this moment a military God. She, she needs a God who will not just fight Goliath but also fight her struggles. She needs a God that will not just fight the devil or rescue people out of Egypt, but she needs somebody to overcome all of her circumstances so she can have joy in him primarily. He has every resource at his disposal. If he created the body, he can heal the body. If he gave us life, he can continue to give us life. And even if he doesn't, isn't that still life? To have life even when life doesn't feel like life. Referring to God as Lord of hosts and herself as servant, she petitions God in verse 11, and she makes a vow. She says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forgive your, forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. The first time I read that, I said, wait. Like... I can understand the petition. She's a childless woman, which is creating turmoil and stress. And so if she's going to ask God for anything, it, it would make sense for her to ask God for a baby. If I didn't have a car, especially if I lived somewhere other than Chicago where public transportation isn't as accessible, I, I'd have a lot of turmoil walking all over the place, especially if they don't have horses to rent. It would be tough. You know, it would, it would be cheap to walk all over the place, but it would be really inefficient. It would be inconvenient depending on the kind of life I live. Like if I had a family or a school, like not to have a car would be tough. So naturally, if I took my cues from Sarah, I say, oh, Lord of hosts, God of heaven's armies, please look on the affliction of your servant and give to me a Honda Civic. I would drive that thing to the ground. Do you understand me? <laughs> would have it till Jesus comes home. But Hannah... <laughs> Hannah does something weird, unexpected. She petitions God for the son that would deliver her from suffering. But then in the same breath, she says, yeah, but when you give them to me, I'm going to give them back. Like you'd expect her to just ask for the gift and that's it. Not for her to say, I'm going to give the gift back to the giver. But this is the thing about that text. What Hannah does in this moment is not anything less than what God has required of us. Every single thing you got is a gift. Your children, your money, your marriage, your ministry, your communication skills, your mind, your ability to reason, even your personality, your ability to walk and speak and dance and laugh and preach and sing. All gifts come down from the Father of light. Some of which you received because you actually asked God for it. Some of which you got just because God is generous. And that's why some of our prayers actually remain unanswered. Because James says you asked it with the wrong motives. You asked it only to spend it on your own passions. But whenever God answers our prayers, giving us whatever it is that we ask for, we should, dare I say, we must give it right back. Nothing, nothing you have is ultimately yours to keep. I, I used Hannah's vow as a metaphor for our own sacrifice. But in this text, this is a narrative, this isn't metaphorical for Sarah. It's an actual display of her devotion. 
by which she declares or gives her son to God as a Nazarene. By doing so, she will mother him until he is weaned, and then her son will live in service to God for the rest of his life. Now we have insight into what Hannah was saying because the text records it. But when this was happening in the temple, Hannah wasn't actually praying out loud. The text says that her lips moved and she prayed silently. Sis was going in to the point that Eli thought she was drunk, thought she was off that something. She says, no, I'm not pouring up, I'm pouring out. That's so corny, but I had to say it. I'm pouring out, I'm not pouring out. Put that on a shirt, see how many people buy it. Christians love corny shirts. I love the Savior God, Jesus Christ. Like, we love wearing that. But anyway, he corrects. <laughs> Eli corrects his presumption. And then he blesses her. Look at verse 18. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. Sit in that. The Hannah that walked into the temple is not the same Hannah that walked out. Before she was vexed, she was anxious. She was distressed. And now the text says, her face is no longer sad. And I'm sure you might have noticed her prayer hasn't been answered yet. She has not known her husband yet. There is no baby in her womb. There is no child in her hands, but, but she has joy anyhow. One commentator said, Hannah had cast her burden upon the Lord, and so her spirit was relieved of its load. It's amazing to experience a burden being lifted by virtue of just being honest with God about what you need. Prayer and petition is so much more than just getting what you want. It is communing with the living God. It is, it is placing yourself in the position to experience the peace that surpasses understanding. But guess what has to happen before the peace comes? Your requests have to be made known. Because sometimes what you thought that you needed was the sun. But what you needed was the sun. Like sometimes prayer sifts out those underlying desires that you didn't have language for, that you didn't even know that you had. Hannah thought she needed Samuel, but she merely wanted him. What she needed was God. And what God did is fill her with more of himself. It sounds so easy. It sounds so easy, yet we are still so anxious. Why is addiction so high? Why is adultery so high? Why is pornography so high? Because we're not dealing with our needs in the temple. We're not sinning just because we are unsatisfied. And we are thirsty and we refuse to go to the woman who has living waters. Maybe because we want control. Maybe because we don't want to be dependent. But if we just follow in the footsteps of Hannah, we have to be desperate enough for the temple. We have to be desperate enough for the altar. And maybe the first part of coming desperate is saying, God, I'm not desperate enough. So do it in me. Maybe it's shame. Maybe you, maybe you think God is like your father who doesn't want to hear from you. Maybe you think that you don't want to be a burden to God with your issues. Maybe it's arrogance. Maybe you're so used to succeeding at everything that you're not as needy as you should be. Both extremes develop out of a misunderstanding of the nature of God, which influences how, when, and why you pray. And maybe... That is why the Lord's Prayer, again, begins by reordering our mind on who it is that we're talking to. Our God, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's why she begins, O Lord of hosts. And in that, in her seeking the Lord of hosts, the military God grants peace. He gives her peace. Peace isn't some random feeling that drops out of the sky. Peace is something you got to fight for. Peace comes from a person who is both father to his children and a fighter for his people who is good all of the time. When Hannah, when Hannah leaves the temple, 
when she leaves the temple, she's not sad anymore. And I think it's because before she got what she wanted, her hope was renewed in the God she had been needing. Notice that the writer makes sure to tell us that once she left, what did she do? She went back home and she ate. It's important. After pouring out her soul to God, she goes home and worships. Verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. I'm almost done. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew his wife. We know what that means. And the Lord. <laughs> that's not something I think about doing after church, but you know. And the Lord. I'm sure my husband does, but verse 20. And, <laughs> it's just continue. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Shortly after Hannah gives birth to Samuel, Hannah and Elkanan, they obviously have a discussion about Hannah's vow. Because in the law, a husband could veto a wife's vow, making it null and void. But instead, he affirms her vow, which is also a sacrifice that Elkanah makes. Because he too, the father, is giving up his son. Hmm. After Samuel is weaned, she takes him up to Shiloh and brings him to Eli the priest, her son that she prayed for, who would now be left in the temple in the service of the Lord all the days of his life. We've seen the problem. We've seen the pattern. We read about the petition. Now let's look at the praise. In chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, we find another prayer of Hannah's. I'm going to read two portions so we can just get a, a, a light sense of the structure. 1 Samuel chapter 2. My heart exalts. My heart is happy in, takes joy in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies, but I rejoice in your salvation. This prayer, when you really read it through the whole thing, one, if you get to Mary's prayer when she was pregnant with Jesus, she follows the same pattern. But this prayer has the same, a few themes, which is that God humbles the proud and exalts the humble. So, so just like God exalted Hannah by giving her a son despite the prideful provocations of Peninnah, we also see an interesting mention of the exaltation of a king in verse 10. It says, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. What makes that noteworthy is that we are in 1 Samuel chapter 1, chapter 2. There is no king in Israel. Hannah's son Samuel will be the one to anoint Israel's first king. But Samuel's just a baby. Saul and and David and, and Solomon and Ahab and Ahaz and Jeroboam and Josiah. Like, ain't none of them a consideration at this point. So it's interesting that she's obviously not pulling from her cultural context to make this prayer. She, she's obviously seeing something that everybody else ain't seen yet. So what, what is possible and probable is that in response to her prayer being answered, she's turned into a prophet all of a sudden. She, she is pointing forward to the Davidic kingdom by which will create and make room for a more sufficient kingdom in which the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, is born from a woman who has never had children before. The, the Messiah is born from a womb that should not have a baby in it. <laughs> a born from a virgin, this, this son, this Messiah, I'm warming up to talk about Jesus. He, he is set apart to live in the service to God all the days of his life. This is foreshadowed. This son, the king, this Messiah is a gift to the world in response to a barren people. People who may or may not have children, but who are still fruitless. Being fruitful is an agricultural thing that talks about discipleship godliness, bearing the fruits of the spirit. We're born in sin, so we're not fruitful until we get Jesus. Jesus comes to, to help people be fruitful people. They have not been fruitful in the sense that they don't love God and they don't love people. And at one point in time, these fruitless people, they were a community of people. They had to go to a city, had to go to a place to deal with their barrenness, had to go to Shiloh, 
had to go to Jerusalem where there was a priest like Eli who could do some work to restore their fellowship with God. Who, who could slaughter some things and, and put some blood on some places. But these, these priests were so imperfect that just like Eli, they might have seen your behavior, but they couldn't even discern your heart. They, they, they don't even see who you really are. They can't, they can't even flesh it out. So these barren people didn't just need a priest. They needed a high priest, one who can not only see your behavior, one that who, who, who wouldn't just cleanse you, but cleanse your conscience. The thing is that, that, that this priest doesn't just change you by shaming you. This priest doesn't just change you by speaking at you. This priest purifies your motives. This priest pays for your debt. This priest becomes the sacrifice you don't have to pay for. So that if ever somebody even recognized what the prophets were trying to say, if they recognized what the apostles were trying to say, if, if they discerned it in the text, then they would see that their greatest need in the entire world wasn't stuff or a child, or a big ministry, or a sufficient-sized church, but God, if ever you get desperate enough by the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, then they would realize that you no longer have to go to a place but a person, Jesus. Whereas Jesus is now the temple, he's the place, he's, he's the priest, he's, he's the sacrifice, he, he is the double portion that we've all been asking for. We, we can have him, we can have him in church, we can have him in our car. We, we can meet him in our pantry and we can meet him in our jobs. We don't even have to go to a place to petition. We don't even have to do nothing but show up. So if ever you are vexed, if ever you are distressed, if ever you are anxious, if ever the emotional chaos feels too heavy to bear, Jesus has said, come to my throne of grace. Not with timidity, but with confidence. For help in your time of need. And guess what? You will receive grace. You will receive mercy. The enemy doesn't want you to believe that. He wants you to go to quick fixes. He wants you to pursue idols. He wants you to trust everything else for satisfaction except the one who will give you satisfaction that sustains you. In Christ, the Lord of hosts is the son, the sacrifice, and the temple. And this God is good. So go to him. Be honest with him. Talk to him. Tell him. Cast it down before him. Beg him. Ask him. Pursue him. Ask about God. And don't just give him your stuff, but give him your entire self. I want to end with a song. I ain't going to sing it. I'm going to read it. <laughs> that I think is suitable. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we, we often forfeit. Oh, what needless, unnecessary pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you. You are worthy of everything. You are worthy of our full selves. You are worthy of every fear. You are worthy of every emotion. You are worthy of every need. We are a needy and a thirsty people, and we need you to fill us. We need you to fill us with power. We need you to fill us with strength. We need you to fill us with courage. We need you to fill us with hope. And we know that hope doesn't disappoint. And so we pray, God, that we would actually not even be cynical about praying for such a thing. That we would have the faith to believe that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly all that we ever ask or think. You are a good God. Help us take advantage of this season so that we would know you deeper. You told us through your, through your apostles that we are to rejoice when trials come because it will help us endure. God, you want us to stay. You, you want us to endure. You, you want us to last. You, you want a people that are mature and that will see you. So help us rejoice in the seasons you have us in. 
Help us to notice that prosperity actually might be damnation for us. Help us to see that the pain is producing something. God, you discipline those that you love. And we don't like it, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who choose to be trained by it. So help us choose to be trained. God, give us people. Give us friends that see us. Help us to see you in new ways through the same text. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.